but what are the sources or generators of the EG and MEG signals? It all starts with individual neurons, even though, of course, we can't measure the activity of individual neurons with these non-invasive methods outside the head. But if an, a neuron receives signals or eventually fires, this means that somewhere along the dendrites, um, electrical charges have been separated from each other, and that creates an electric voltage difference, an electric potential difference around these dendrites. And this is something that if you get enough of those uh, from a large enough number of, of neurons and dendrites, something that can sum up and can eventually be measured with EEG and MEG. So I like to think about that as a small electric battery that switches on whenever this piece of cortex becomes active. So imagine this is the neocortex here. So these dendrites are nicely aligned like soldiers in a row. And if you have several of them receiving inputs or firing at the same time, then their corresponding electric dipoles here sum up, and this produces a little battery. And the signal from this battery, it's within a conducting medium, the brain. So these signals will eventually be uh, measurable in EEG and MEG sensors. Uh, more about that in a second. Um, I mean, just briefly, you know, I just would just like to briefly state what these sources are. I mean, they're apical dendrites of pyramidal cells. So important to note is not not the soma or the axons, it's the dendrites close to the soma that produce the biggest signals. It's not the action potentials, also more about that in a second. Uh, and also at this point, I think it's already important to highlight that EEG and MEG are sensitive to the same kind of physiological sources, but to uh, basically with differential sensitivity. So they, they see the same sources, but from different angles, if you like. And as I said, we can't really look at individual neurons with these non-invasive methods. We need about 1 million synapses to activate simultaneously to produce something we can measure macroscopically outside the head. Luckily, there are about 10,000 cells per square millimeters. I mean, these are just figures I found in textbooks. Um, and that means with a few square millimeters of cortex, we are in business and we can potentially measure the EEG and MEG signals. Uh, of course, there are certain caveats with that, but maybe more about that in, in other presentations. And also, it doesn't mean that all these sources are ne necessarily focal and, and you know, uh, localized just within a few square millimeters. They can be widely distributed, but I think that gives you an idea of um, what these signals reflect. You know, there are tens of thousands, if not millions, of dendrites and, and neurons active if we see a signal in the EEG and MEG. How do we actually measure them? Well, I mean, we put sensors on the head, like EG electrodes or around the head, like MEG sensors. Uh, why can we measure these signals outside the head? Um, for EEG, that's because of um, volume currents. So if you put a little battery somewhere in a conducting medium, then that means you'll have a current flow. And the brain is basically salty fat. So if you put a little battery there, a little dipolar source, it means that Currents flow around the brain. Uh, we call them volume currents in contrast to the primary currents. So the primary current the dipole is what we actually want to know about. So where it is potentially and what it does, the volume currents are just passive currents that we are not really interested in. Um, but they are the ones that eventually also go through the skull and produce electric potential differences on the scalp. And that's what we measure with EEG. Unfortunately, the skull, um, maybe I should show that here because this is actually not a very accurate picture. So in reality, of course, these currents become smaller the further they are away from the dipole source, but also they are much smaller in the skull because it has much lower conductivity uh, than the brain. So the currents that finally reach the, the scalp are uh, much smaller than the ones close to the uh, dipole source. And that unfortunately has a bit of a, has a very um, unfortunate effect on, on EEG signals. So they are smeared and dampened by, by the skull. MEG also measures magnetic fields from the volume current. So MEG measures magnetic fields. You know, I mean, in, there are different types of sensors. Um, and these magnetic fields are produced both by the primary source as well as by the volume current. So MEG is sensitive to volume currents. But these volume currents are biggest around the dipole, and they are much smaller, for example, in the skull. And that's why sometimes we actually don't even model the currents in the skull. Uh, more about that in another section. 
But the important thing is that for MEG, head, head geometry, and in particular the skull uh, geometry, is less important than for EEG. So it's a bit easier to model these kinds of signals. Yes, also important to say all effects are instantaneous. So whenever the battery changes, you immediately have a change in your signal. So sometimes we talk about brain waves, but there are no waves of that sort of traveling around the, um, the head. So we really measure sort of instantaneous signal changes of these dipolar sources. And as I already said, these volume currents affect both EEG and MEG, uh, but EEG more than MEG. To give you an idea of the scales of the electric and magnetic signals, that we measure, I think everybody is familiar you know, with household batteries in the range of a few volts. Um, compared to that, cell membrane potentials are in the range, I mean, the resting state uh, potential there is uh, in the range of 70 millivolts, so 70 thousandth of a volt. If you want to measure electrocardi the electrocardiogram, you'll be in the range of one millivolt. And the heart is actually quite a huge dipole. So it's one big dipole that basically keeps, you know, keeps going all the time. And if we are looking at the raw EEG, you know, on the screen while we are recording it, we are in the range of 10 tens of microvolts. That means millionth of a volt. Uh, eye blinks, unfortunately, are much bigger. So there can be a few hundreds micro microvolts. And if we then go down to the average event-related potentials, we are in the range of microvolts or even less if we look at difference waves and the more subtle effects that we are usually interested in. So they are in the range of microvolts. <clears throat> uh, MEG is maybe a bit less familiar to many of us. Um, so measured in Tesla, one Tesla is already quite a huge magnetic field. So that would be a health and safety risk if you have that in your office or at home. Uh, the Earth's magnetic field is around um, a 10 thousandth of uh, a Tesla. So that's what's around us all the time. And we hardly notice it unless we have a compass needle. I mean, it's still strong enough to move a little compass needle, of course. If you go one or two orders of magnitude lower, you have the magnetic noise of a town. Obviously, that depends on the town you're in. If you're in one of the nice meadows in the middle of Cambridge, then maybe you are relatively lucky. And I guess there's some pun about magnetic fields in there. But I just can't think of anything right now. And if you go further down the scale, so another one thousandth of that, then you are in the range of uh, the heart's magnetic field, cardiomagnetism. Again, a really strong signal in compared at least to the brain. Um, and if you then go, go down even further, so now we are at about a billionth of the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, then we talk, but we can talk about spontaneous magnetic fields, resting state magnetic fields, or the evoked magnetic fields. And if you go, if you want to go subcortical, even lower than that. So these are really tiny magnetic fields. So that's why we need these big machines and big, big shielded rooms to, to measure them. Uh, one word um, that I want to spend on, on uh, this is because it's, um, we do not measure action potential. So that's maybe sometimes what, what people may think, but it's actually lucky for us because the, you know, the big, the stuff that's happening along the cables is not really that important. What we actually are interested in is of course where the gray matter uh, neurons are active. And luckily that's what we are measuring. So we are measuring signals of the apical dendrites and not axons. And why is that? Um, that's because along an axon, it's, actually, it's a quite a complicated, physiological process that creates these traveling signals. So these are not just passive currents like in a copper cable. Um, and uh, in short, well, you have inflowing currents at one point of the cell membrane and these currents then go to both sides within the, within the axon and create a quadrupole. So these are two currents, two dipoles in opposite directions and they more or less cancel each other out. Uh, if you look from a distance, you know, it's hardly visible. On top of that, they are quite short-lived, so they travel, well, I don't really know how quickly now, but probably in the range of microseconds, um, while um, the signals along the dendrites that I showed earlier, they are probably there for several milliseconds, maybe 10 milliseconds. So that's enough to have synchronous activity um, across a large number of neurons and dendrites. So that's why we measure these dendritic uh, dipoles, but not the action potentials. You will often come across 
um, the term Maxwell's equations. When people talk about the physics of EEG and MEG, um, it's not really that important for the interpretations of the signals. I would just like to highlight that within this framework of Maxwell's equations, which describe classical electrodynamics, we basically don't need anything that's dynamic. So we are not really looking at the effects of induction or anything like that, or anything that depends on the temporal derivative of these signals. We do not really deal with waves, with physical waves uh, or electromagnetic waves. So these are all static effects I mentioned earlier. As soon as something in the brain changes, um, you know, something in our measured signal changes, there are no time delays or anything like that. Uh, and that's often called the quasi, um, quasi-static approximation of Maxwell's equations. Uh, what we sometimes need to take into account is the type of sensor we use to measure the signals. EEG is relatively simple, so we usually just have one electrode. There's basically one point on the scalp that measures an electric potential. Uh, I mean, there are actually different designs for EEG as well, but this is by far the most common one. And what I'm illustrating here is, you know, if the electrode was on this spot, let's imagine this is sort of a point on the scalp and you are plotting, you know, how sensitive this electrode is to different, different sources in terms of strength, but also in terms of the direction of the sources that produce the maximum field, then EEG is relatively straightforward. If the dipole points towards the electrode, it produces its largest effect on the electrode. The further it is away, the smaller the effect is. And if it's actually perpendicular, you know, to, with respect to the, to the radius here, the line between the electrode and the dipole. So if it was perpendicular like that, it would actually not produce any signal in this electrode. With uh, MEG, it's a little bit more complicated. So the most simple way, or the simplest way to measure magnetic fields with a magnetometer is just a coil. So a, mag a magnetic field would, would produce, uh, you can measure the magnetic flux within this coil um, and read that out. And if you did that, then you will have something like a sensitivity map or lead field, like, a, like I explained here with an, e with an EEG electrode, which looks a bit differently. So for uh, magnetic dipoles, the right-hand rule applies. So current in the direction of the thumb, and the magnetic field goes in the direction of, of the other fingers, so around, around the current. So if you imagine a dipole being in a location like this, um, so if it points tangentially to this sensor, and a measure of the right-hand rule, so the magne magnetic field would go through this coil and produce the maximum field. If it was actually perpendicular to that direction, it would go around in a different uh, plane and it would actually not produce any magnetic field uh, in this sensor. So this produces some of these topographies that we will see later for magnetic and electric fields, so on in the sensor arrays. Some MEG systems also use gradiometers, and in this uh, there are two different types. Uh, one is the axial gradiometer, so you have two coils, and they are wired in opposite directions to each other. So one is basically subtracted from the other. Why would people do that? Well, that way you subtract out everything that's homogeneous. So everything that's very similar here to here will be subtracted out. And that's the case uh, for sources that are far away. So the further a source is away, the more homogeneous the field will be around this axial gradiometers. So if this is a few centimeters apart here, um, that means it's a noise reduction method. While sources that are close by, like for example, brain sources just directly underneath this coil, they will produce a much bigger uh, field here compared to here. That means the difference will be larger. So it's a way of subtracting the noise or reducing the noise from distant sources. However, sources that are in the brain and a bit further away, like subcortical sources, will also be diminished. I mean, they might not completely be suppressed, but there will be at least um, this, this arrangement is less sensitive to deeper sources than an MEG, a magnetometer on its own. And then there are also planar gradiometers. Uh, in this case, you have a similar arrangement, one coil here, one coil there, there. They are subtracted from each other, but they are next to each other in the same plane. It has the same effect. Homogeneous magnetic fields will cancel each other out. That means distant sources will be suppressed. Nearby sources will produce the uh, biggest difference in these two coils. But this also has the effect that you have a different kind of sensitivity profile here, a different kind of lead field. And now 
the source that's underneath the sensor actually produces the biggest difference. That means in this case, if you put a lot of them around the head um, and you see a peak in your distribution without any doing any source localization, you have at least some evidence that there's a source close by. Also, um, there are two types of these gradiometers. You can have two orthogonal ones uh, in two different directions. And these two sensitivity profiles would be orthogonal to each other. And they would also be orthogonal to this one of a single magnetometer. That means in principle, you can measure three very three independent types of information in a single location. So you can put three of those, two of those and one of those into one location and you measure three types of independent information in one location. That means you can sample your signal much more efficiently as if you just use the same kind of sensor all over. Uh, and if you then also combine that with EEG, you get another independent type of measurement. So that is the arrangement that we have in our um, triac system here at the CBU. So they have these 102 locations, 102 microchips that have, or chips, that have three types of sensors, one magnetometer and two gradiometers here. Uh, planar gradiometers in one location, you can optionally choose to record from EEG as well. Um, so this is actually quite a clever arrangement to get maximum information you know, from these from the sensor array. And finally, um, we will talk more about sensitivity of EEG and MEG and spatial resolution later. But I just want to say already, just based on the physics, uh, without doing any mathematics or source estimation here, there are already a few things you can say about the sensitivity of EEG and MEG. So this cartoon here shows a few sources that are either visible in MEG, so plus here means it's visible by MEG, or EEG, so a plus for EEG means it's visible for, MEG, for EEG, and minus correspondingly, it's not visible in either of these, in these modalities. So if you have a dipole source that is tangential, that means parallel to the scalp, let's just assume that there's a very round head, um, then this can be seen by MEG and EEG if you put the sensors in the right spot. If you have a radial dipole that points towards the scalp, um, then this means you can only see it with EEG. So MEG will be completely uh, silent. And that's, well, I'm not going to explain it in very much detail, but this is because the current flow of these sources, at least if the, if the head was a proper, proper sphere, uh, the current flow would be completely symmetrical. That means everything that flows in this direction cancels something out that, that goes in that direction. So it's not just uh, a matter of uh, putting the sensor maybe in a different direction or so. I mean, the magnetic field would really be zero outside the head. Uh, that also means that if the source is somewhere in the center of the head, it's necessarily radial. It can only point away you know, from the center here. That means deep sources, very deep sources are hardly visible by MEG, but they are at least visible to some degree by EEG, even of course a bit less. So further away from the sensors means lower amplitudes, but in principle, at least there's still signal left for EEG. And if you look at slightly more artificial distributions, like all these radial dipoles on a closed surface, you, can, you can't see them with either MEG or EEG. So um, if you have a source like that, you know, something that goes around like a snake and bites its own tail, then uh, you would see it with MEG, but not with EEG. And if you have something weird like that, I guess that's a special case of this distribution here, a closed surface with radial dipoles all around, then you can also neither see it with MEG or EEG. So you just have to be aware, and, and don't worry if I didn't explain it in detail why, but I mean, this is just sort of the, the laws of, of, the, of the physics of this problem. Um, so this already tells you that EEG and MEG are sensitive to different types of sources. Unfortunately, there are sources that neither MEG or EEG can see. Um, so we just have to be aware um, that, yeah, we are, we are only looking at a bit of a, a, you know, a shadow of the real brain activity and more about that in some of the next, uh, next sessions.